So Mila is the Senior Conditioning Editor of Media, Communication, and Cultural Studies at SAGE. She's a wealth of information. We've been speaking since she came, and I'm like taking all of these great mental notes. And her work has been in publishing for over 10 years. And you work in not only journals, books, but also social media and video. So there's a wide breadth of information here. Um, so we'd like to start with your presentation called How to Get Published. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yeah, so my name is Mila, and that's, you just said what I was about to say, which is who I am and what I do. Um, and it is a bit unusual that I do work across pretty much any kind of content. Um, when I started in publishing and I would give a talk like this, it was, you know, get, you know, publish yourself in books and journals. And a few years ago, I stopped using the whole books and journals thing. And now we talk about content. Um, and it's really, that's about dissemination, that's about finding the right way to get your research, to get your message, to get your ideas out there. Um, and so while I'm primarily going to be talking about traditional books and, and book publishing, um, at the end of this or afterwards over lunch, if you do have any questions about journals, journal articles, publishing, in that kind of area, please feel free to ask me because half of my life is spent there, um, even though I'm talking mainly about books here. Um, I also want to talk to you a little bit about SAGE as well, which is where I work, because a lot of my presentation is about understanding who publishers are and what the differences are between them. Um, so SAGE is a mid-sized publishing company um, founded in 1965 by Sarah Miller McCune. She uh, was based in New York, and she had a $250 uh, entrepreneurship loan, and she sold her air conditioner. And she started Sage with that startup. <laughs> um, and we've grown quite a bit since then. We're still primarily a social science publisher. Um, and we do publish, again, across books, journals, new kinds of products, a lot of experiments. So we're quite forward-looking, um, which I think will really help you to try and get a grip on what's changing um, in publishing as well. So we're really right in the middle. We're not a big corporate publisher. We're not a university press. We're not one of the small boutique publishers. We're still independent. Long may that continue. Um, which does mean that we're in a position to respond to think, quite a bit of, of experience and questions that you might have. Um, so what I'm going to go over with you today is kind of in two parts. And the first part is a general overview. Because before we get to the practical advice, it's really important for you to understand what's been changing in the publishing industry, especially over the past five years. Um, it used to be quite a sleepy industry. Believe me, we're all awake now. <laughs> um, so lots of things are happening. And again, going from books versus journals into content and understanding how publishers are reacting to that and how that impacts where you want to disseminate your research. It's really important to get the, the big picture and understand a bit of the vocabulary so we will be talking you through some of the, the big changes and developments and jargon and things like that. And then the second half will be the advice bit on thinking about your PhD, thinking about transforming your research. What makes a good book? Don't take that for granted. I'm going to talk you through that. And then from that, how you can really start getting um, your ideas and your thoughts put together in a way that a publisher can relate to and we'll want to have a conversation with you about. And then I'm going to go on to how do you assess publishers, because we're always assessing you, um, but how can you look for the right kind of home to think about publishing your own work as well. So um, publishing industry, this is um, academic publishing started in the, um, in the 1450s with Oxford and Cambridge University Press. But that was the very, very beginning. And it really was quite simple. There were scholars and libraries like this one. They did research. They wrote a book. The university press published it. It went back into the library. And that was about it. And it was all pretty medieval um, for the next 500 years. Picture left, honestly. Not very much changed. Um, but this is a bit more of what it looks like today. 
um, it's very much an ecology with mega developments happening. So we've got skyscrapers, big conglomerate companies, we've got little boutique companies really trying to find space, we've got startups, there's lots of traffic in between, shops opening up and closing. So it's much more difficult to really try and navigate the space where so many different kinds of publishers are all trying to occupy what is a very different, a very small um, and narrow space actually. So who are these publishers? Um, basically, up at the very top, we've got, you know, the novels that you read. Trade. Trade means um, Penguin, Random House, generally novel publishers, some nonfiction. But if you go into Waterstones, all those, all those books that you see in there, that's trade. Um, we've got the mega big textbook publishers. They tend to be dominant in the U.S., but they also work here. McGraw, Pearson, probably in your past as an undergraduate student, you've bought textbooks from these people. Then we've got commercial academic publishers who tend to have a bigger portfolio. So Sage is in there. So we do textbooks, but also all kinds of other stuff. Routledge, Blackwell, Palgrave. Um, and then I'm going to ask you in a minute why you think this line is here. Um, and then university presses. Again, you, in the UK, the big ones are Oxford University Press, Cambridge, um, but also Manchester, Edinburgh, um, Liverpool University Press has just won an award as um, top independent publisher. Uh, I think this was last year with the Independent Publishers Association. So interesting things are happening. Then, of course, over in the US, we've got Yale, uh, Harvard, Duke University Press. Those are the really big established university presses there as well. Smaller boutique publishers that tend to have a global presence, Intellect, Peter Lang, Quality Ashgate, Paradigm. These are all presses that have more of a, a sort of dominance in social science and, and humanities. Um, and then something that's new are electronic only publishers. So Ebury is a good example of that. And they're trying out different kinds of business models as well. We've got open access initiatives that tend to come out of a university department that is funded or it's got some passionate activist academic who's really driving forward a new, a new project. Um, open book publishers is based in Cambridge, driven by a guy named Rupert at the university there. They're doing lots of interesting stuff. Um, open Humanities Press is another one. Um, and another recent development with open access and digital publishing are the vanity publishers. Um, and I swear, one day, one of you will, re will receive an email from one of these offering to publish your PhD, if you haven't already. That all of you might <laughs> probably receive an email from them. And they can look pretty legitimate. Um, it's important to understand that these are now part of the mix, and you have to decide how you really want to interact with them. So where you are as PhD students, graduates, early career researchers, trying to find your place for research, this is where you are, is roughly in the middle here. Um, to a certain extent, some of the commercial academic publishers, like Palgrave, for example, do have scholarly lists. Um, but up here, this is big print run textbook territory. This is scholarly research area. And this is a void. <laughs> okay, so this is um, historically, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's happened to the monograph because that's quite, um, it's really important to understand the history of what's changed and how, how research used to get disseminated what, and what's gone on and really what the benefits and, and new opportunities but also the challenges are of that. Um, until quite recently, there were basically two places where you would publish your research. There's the journal, there's one of the big ones that I work on, um, and then there's the scholarly monograph. And the monograph, I mean, you all know what that is, but it's, it's worth me just emphasizing a little bit that this is a specialist piece of research that often comes out of a PhD but doesn't have to. It, until recently, has been print only. Um, it has a readership of <coughs> between 150 and 200 people. Um, monographs used to be really easy to get published. And one of the reasons why is that every library would just buy one. Um, that's, you know, I would hear, and this was until about 15 years ago, I'd hear from, you know, one of my senior authors, oh, I've got this great young postdoc, really, really hot topic, great research, you should look into this. I think, brilliant. 
get that manuscript, send it out for review, great glowing review, brilliant, we'll publish it, 1,500 libraries will buy it, that was wonderful. About 15 years ago, um, things really started changing, and it started with Elsevier, and I understand some of you met some Elsevier people recently. Elsevier realized that the journal subscription market was really inelastic, and that meant that they could raise the price of a journal, and it wouldn't affect how many people subscribed to it. So the supply-demand relationship didn't work for journals the way it works for toothpaste or any other commodity. So what happened is they whoa, started jacking up their prices, up to 15% per year sometimes. And the libraries who were committed to their subscriptions had to keep subscribing. They didn't really have a choice, but they had to make cuts elsewhere. So what did they stop buying? They stopped buying monographs. And they increasingly started realizing, wow, that research that was in the monograph is probably in the journal that I'm subscribing to anyway. Why should I pay twice? So sales for monographs plummeted. So it went from about 1,500, which definitely pays for publishing that book, down to now an average is maybe about 200, which is a loss for the publisher. So that's one of the real challenges that we have to face to. Um, and so with publishers, you know, gaily going along, publishing lots of monographs, then that not really working anymore, what's changed? They've had to look for new kinds of books, new kinds of ways of getting research out there. So this means that most publishers have got like a bigger ecology of books that they're looking at and trying to publish. And one of the most important pieces of advice that I can give you is to understand these different categories and not get them mixed up and not assume that one of them is going to do the job of all of them. And if you can explain that understanding, publishers will be really happy and quite willing to talk to you. Um, I get a lot of book proposals where it says, this is my research for my PhD, and it's going to be a core textbook, and it's going to be interesting for the, for the average reader down on the high street, and it's going to be a bestseller in Waterstones. People really do assume, oh, it's going to be everything, and no, it's not. And that's absolutely fine. So it is important to be able to understand this. So I've already talked about monographs. Um, kind of the next thing that comes after the monograph is what I call a, a big think book. So this is something that is a scholarly book driven a bit more by theory and ideas than by empirical research, but quite often has a grounding in the research that somebody has done. They tend to come from big names, but they're agenda setting, scholars read them, student, you know, higher level students might read them. Um, so that's something that we're doing. Now shorts, again, this is an example of what's changing. Um, the short is this brand new concept for what a book can be. And it's about, so where a, a normal book, a big think book is maybe 75 or 80,000 words. A short is about 30 or 40,000 words, so bigger than a journal article, shorter than a book. It's published like a little book. They come in really, really big series. And this idea is only about one year old. So Palgrave has have started publishing some. Sage, we're just about to launch into this. But this is a whole new outlet for empirical research that is qualifying for the REF which is very exciting. Um, another kind of book then is journalism. Again, sort of a lot of academic ideas thinking. A lot of politics professors, for example, might write books that really are reaching out to a bigger, almost trade audience, as I was mentioning. That's a kind of journalism. Trade also, this is a bit more in history, literature. If you have a really sexy topic, um, particularly the, the US university presses, will be looking to adapt your research for a general audience. It has to be trendy, so it's not for everyone. History is perennially trendy. So if you're a historian, then you've got a, a good chance of getting in with a trade book. Um, I do have a good friend of mine who published her PhD with Yale University Press, um, and it's been reviewed in the New York Times. So it can happen. Um, and then textbooks. So when we think back about monographs and you know selling 200 copies, mm, OK, how do we make that work? We want. We want, in order to break even, we need to sell seven, eight hundred, a thousand is good, three thousand is even better. If libraries are not buying books, and scholars buy books, but there's only 75 of them buying the book, who is buying books? Students. 
students still buy books, and they still buy books in print, which is great for us. So a lot of publishers have started looking at how can I take ideas, research, uh, teaching and learning, put them together, and somehow get that onto a course reading list. And so that's the textbook development. Sage, we do a lot of that. All of the other commercial academic presses, they do that as well. But also, many of the boutique publishers will ask, hmm, now, how can I get paperback sales on this book that's more like a, a think piece, but can I push that onto courses, even a supplementary reading? You're going to see that coming up on um, book proposal, questionnaires, and so on. So it is a question to be ready to answer, actually. But these are generally the kinds of books and formats that d we're dealing with now. Some textbooks also, believe it or not, have come from PhDs. It's not unheard of. It's probably not the best place to start for many of you now, but that certainly can happen. And so we're also doing other new stuff. So I've talked to you about, about new formats in terms of pivots. So we've got these things coming out. They're called Sage Swifts. <laughs> um, we started calling them Sage Shorts, but that doesn't go over in the UK so well. Um, so Sage, so the, <laughs> the idea of Swift also is a very quick turnaround. So we have a, a, a production speed of a journal article. So once something has been accepted into this format, it can be published within 12 weeks, which is astonishing. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, another big development happening are electronic, oh, electronic open access monographs. So going back to open book publishers, people like that doing electronic only, again, really quick turnaround, um, accessibility, uh, wide, sort of really wide dissemination. So there's a lot to investigate there in terms of that kind of benefit. Um, and then what, what we're also doing with research is, OK, if we have one monograph and we can only sell 200 copies, that doesn't work. But what if we have 100 or 500 and we set up a big database of research that is searchable within some kind of subject area and we make it a little bit like Netflix so that via libraries people can have subscriptions to it with kinds of digital functionality that really works. Um, that's another direction that we're going in. And so, you know, if I come back in five years, I have a feeling I'm going to be talking a lot more about that, and that is going to open up new opportunities for research and PhD publishing as well. So definitely something to keep your eye on. That's kind of a bright light for, um, uh, for, for research publishing in the future. Um, so even with all this change and all this diversity and everybody trying to do f different things and these experiments, actually, uh, what publishers want really hasn't changed that much. So this is what we're after. Buyership. Yes, we want readers. Yes, we want uh, readership. Um, we're very happy to disseminate and, and support research activity. But what the publisher actually wants is for someone to buy the book because that's what helps us keep going. Market knowledge. Um, this is really important. We want to be able to guess how well your book is going to do. Who's going to buy it? What are they going to use it for? Um, so we spend a lot of time doing research. We also ask authors, potential authors, for their insight and input on that as well. Evidence of what works, especially in this changing digital environment, is really important for us. We want to understand our audience. So we, I, spend a lot of time thinking about readers. How do they read? Do they read linearly? Do they dip in and out? Um, how do they navigate a book? Do they want something accessible? Do they need something explained? Do they need a lot of data? Um, so understanding an audience is crucial. And it's funny that even though I work in media studies, I spend all my time talking to media studies scholars who are, many of them, audience theory specialists, and they forget that. All of you have got an audience, a reader, and it's important to understand who they are. I'm going to keep saying this, so I'm really going to repeat until boring. It's important to understand your audience. Publishers spent a lot of time thinking about that. And a business model. And again, that's not something that, as scholars, you are going to spend very much time thinking about, but we're thinking about constantly. And it affects the kind of decisions that we're making. Even the nonprofit university presses 
have to find a way to pay for it. And publishing is very expensive. You might think the expensive part is paper, and with the internet, we don't have to pay for that anymore. Absolutely not. The expensive part is labor, always. And what we have to pay for is uh, me, partly, copy editors. Copy editors, that's a skill. That's really expensive. Um, if it's digital, somebody's going to be sitting there coding and tagging everything. Very expensive. So with more and more platforms that we're delivering on, there's more and more that we have to pay for. And so more and more, we have to think about what our business model is. And that's why we often ask you a lot of questions about market. Publishing strategy. Everybody's doing something differently. For some people, it's high volume. Tons and tons of monographs. Push them all out. For some people, it's curation. Choose the very, very best things. Have a really nice little package in one or two subject areas. For some, it's teaching courses, driving education. And sustainability. And again, this whole issue of change. We're changing. And I get asked more often than I would like, Mila, are you going to have a job in two years? <laughs> and oh, I hope so. <laughs> um, and so publishers are very concerned about understanding and being able to respond to change at the right speed so that we're not wasting our money in experiments that don't work, but we are keeping up with being able to support the research community in the way that works for us as well. So. That's where we're at as publishers. And I know you're ready to hear about your PhDs. So actually, um, this one is over to you for a moment. You're all experts. So you know much more about this than I do. What makes a good PhD? Isidro, what makes a good PhD? <laughs> Data. Yeah? I'd say something that's relevant beyond the little hole that you like yourself. In. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. Yeah. It depends where you're talking about reading it. It's back to your audience again, because good for yeah. an academic audience mm. might not be good for a general audience. Well, a PhD doesn't have a general audience. I'm thinking of when you come to it. Oh, yeah, I'll get there. <laughs> yes, I guess you're, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, but just the PhD part. I mean, that's what you're embedded in. What's going to make it good? Focus. Focus, focus on argument. And focus of argument, um, methodology, really being able to explain what you do, being able to prove how much you've read, right? It's, it's literature review. It's demonstrating to your committee that you have grasped a literature and a methodology and that you've answered a research question um, you probably need to demonstrate some jargon we to show that we have to be original as well. Exactly. That's right. That's right. And interesting. <laughs> yeah. And to contribute. And also to point to future directions. Um, so, sort of, you know, I've taken it this far with the PhD. We, you know, what can further research do? How can this introduce new research questions into the mix? Right? So, that's a good PhD. So, what, what makes a good book? then. Um, so this is what I spend my time thinking about. And this is a very subjective list. This is only me and, and, and what I think as, as a reader as well as an editor. Um, and in a way, I think this applies to you know, novels as, as, as much as to, to other books. Um, an introduction. A book needs to start gently. It's kind of like a, like a handshake, like welcome in. A book should respect its reader. Um, it's a bit like, a, like the analogy I always use is a swimming pool. A book should never throw the reader in at the deep end. You can get them there, but the book is like a swimming lesson. Get them into the shallow end, teach them a few strokes, get them to the deep end of the swimming pool. A book should always have its audience in mind. That's really important. You need to know who your reader is and also who your reader isn't. Be honest about that and have an understanding of what your book is what your reader is looking for, what your, what your reader needs. Um, a good book should be evenly structured and it should be easy to navigate. So that means the book has a map. That's actually your table of contents. So it should flow, it should tell you where to find things, it should have keywords right up front in your table of contents, 
so that someone can scan that and think, oh yeah, great, I, what I need is in chapter four. Um, leaves the reader satisfied. What I mean by that is that's know how much you're going to assume on the part of your reader. Does your reader understand the Gramscian concept of ideology already, or do they need you to explain that to them? Or does your reader actually really need to see a whole lot of data and how you worked it out? Um, so understand your reader's needs, and if you leave the reader satisfied, that means that they have got what they were looking for. Um, and leaving the reader satisfied is also a good conclusion. A PhD often invites further thinking or further questions. A book has to finish. It has to conclude. Um, it also should not be too long. Length is very important because that's the patience of your reader. That's also the cost of the publisher. So don't assume that longer is smarter or that longer is more impressive or better um, because it's not. Um, I always like to quote Mark Twain who said, oh, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one. And long books, okay, if you're Max Weber, you can do economy and society. If you're the rest of us, shorter, please. And that does help you think better and focus and drive your argument and your message. What, Not too long. What word length do you mean by shorter, please? 80, 80 to 90,000 words. This is standard book length. So if you see a 240-page book, that's about 80,000 words. Yeah. Um, and a pleasure to read. And... I know that it's probably not something you're thinking about a lot at the moment, style. As a reader, as an editor, I'm probably a bit overboard on style. I do want a pleasure. I do want something that is engaging, that makes me want to go into the next chapter as well. So I definitely don't discount writing style. And it is something that, even for academic books, I do assess. Um, and through the peer review process, I ask other people to assess as well. So just to recap a bit, here's the difference between a PhD and a book. You can see they're almost, they have a relationship, but they're almost opposites. A PhD is fulfilling an academic requirement. It's there for you to graduate. A book fulfills a desire to speak broadly. A PhD is rehearsing scholarship. It is an exercise for you to become a scholar. A book has absorbed scholarship and is doing something else with it. It's explaining it, it's transmitting it, it's repackaging it. A PhD, in many, in many cases, I know it depends on the subject area, suppresses an authorial voice or doesn't privilege the authorial voice. But a book does. It creates and sustains an authorial voice in a book who you are as the author, how you express yourself, is very important, almost as important as what it is that you have to say. A PhD stops, poses further questions, but a book concludes, it wraps things up. Um, a PhD ultimately is for an audience of about four or five people, that's your committee. A book is for lots of people you've never met, hopefully thousands of them. Um, a PhD is assessed and archived. That's what happens with it. A book is sold. A book is going into the market, so it needs to do quite different things. So when you're thinking about getting from all that PhD stuff into the book stuff and transforming your research into something that can go out into the market, this is some overall advice. Um, the first rule is stop calling it your PhD. Don't even think of it as your PhD. You think of it in your mind as my book. This is my book. And certainly don't tell any editor or publisher this is my PhD. You have every right to feel incredibly proud of your PhD and want to tell everybody that you finished it. Um, but that stops. From now on, it's your book. Number two is your book is going to start not really with the manuscript that you've just written. It's going to start with a book proposal. Um, and I'll be telling you a bit more about that in a minute. The academic conventions 
uh, are great for your PhD. You have to demonstrate that you've mastered them. They're not necessarily applying to a book. I'll give you some tips in a moment. With your book, be ready to rewrite. You can't just, you know, cut out some chapters and change the title. You have a new audience in mind, and going back to that issue of voice <coughs> and readers' needs, you might have to rewrite. It really, again, depends on the subject area. Some subject areas are more narrative than others. Um, anthropology, for example, tends to start out quite narrative. In a PhD, you probably don't have to rewrite all of that. But be ready to do so. Someone might ask you to. Imagine what kind of book it is. So it's my book, but it's like it's my monograph. Or no, I'm going to make this make it into this kind of a book because I've got this relationship with Yale University Press. So it's not just any book. Start thinking about the types of books that I was just showing you, and really where you want your book to go, and who you see as being its readers. So understand who are going to be your new readers. Remember, your PhD committee, they've read your PhD because they have to. Hopefully they enjoyed it, but they're reading it because it's not their choice. With your book, that's not the case anymore. Someone has to choose to read your book. You have to start imagining who those people are and why and what they're looking for. And I mentioned again this whole issue about textbooks because, again, even if you are doing um, a, a monograph or what's very clearly a scholarly book, you're going to a university press, you're going to OUP, you're talking to an editor there, you're going to Polity, talking to an editor there, they will ask you, does this have a student readership? Because they want to know if they can do a paperback. So this is the way to think about answering that question. You should be ready to answer that question. And you can say, my book's not a textbook, but I am explaining and illustrating. I'm not just describing empirical data. Case studies, that's a great way to bring really rich stuff that you've discovered through your research into a book. Um, case studies are a, a wonderful pedagogical tool. Um, we really like those, and that's a good application for rich data. Um, think about the voice again. De be able to demonstrate in a sample chapter that it's not just kind of the formulaic writing that can go into a PhD. A textbook is about authority and engaging a student reader, again, keeping readers in mind. If you can demonstrate that you're doing that with your chapter, that's great. Um, a good textbook is making the sophisticated clear and lucid. And that's actually good practice for anyone becoming a scholar, um, no matter what kind of book you're working on, frankly. But especially important if you're imagining some kind of student reader being able to prove that to a publisher. Relevance for a course. Again, um, you know, go and, go and check out. Do a module search. Go on Google and see, gosh, there's so many courses on feminism and gender right now. That's obviously a really hot topic. This, I can sort of frame my book in that direction uh, and really demonstrate potential course pickup that way. Absolutely. And writing for a student reader should be fun. Um, and that's something that I always encourage. And so if you are starting to imagine someone learning, maybe thousands of people learning from what you're writing, that's pretty exciting. So this is the practical advice of taking the PhD out of your book. Um, it's probably going to be a lot shorter, so you're going to have to do some cutting. Um, a, huge, a book is usually 70, 80, 90,000 words, depending on its function. Um, but that's the rough length that you're going to be thinking of. Um, in terms of structure, probably eight to ten chapters, not four chapters. Um, the kind of reader patience for a single chapter is about eight or 9,000 words. And again, thinking of a new kind of reader, you may have to rewrite quite a bit of it. Um, hopefully that's something that you might look forward to. Um, if you don't like writing, then well, there are ways to get around that, but <laughs> hopefully that would be something that's fun. Lit review, drop. Methodology, drop. Uh, you should be able to you know, men mention where you come from, but that whole chapter goes. Footnotes, ditch them. We don't want footnotes. 
empirical detail, probably you're going to have to lessen that. doesn't mean that you have to cut it out, um, but you probably have to weave that in with your theory throughout and not just in separate chapters. And again, a lot of this really depends on your subject area. Um, humanities will be very different from social science and so on. Publishers are looking for international markets. It's an extra two, three, four hundred sales. That's definitely something that we want. If you can draw out international implications of something that you've really pursued in a national context, if you've done comparative research that you can expand, definitely emphasize that. Um, and it might take a little bit more investigation to really look at some policy angle on intellectual property, for example, in the UK, that you can then talk about a little bit or make reference to in the US and Brazil and China. Um, that's a really big benefit. Books that are just about one region will stay there. So I said earlier that the place that you start is with a book proposal. So I'm going to talk you through what they are and how they should work. You should never email a publisher your PhD in files. I'm not going to read it. I don't have time. Um, you should also don't say, oh, I've got a manuscript already. A publisher, in acad academic publisher, they want a proposal. And the reason is they want something brief that they can assess that is also looking at the market. Um, but it just gives them a flavor of something, and they will help you develop it if it's something that looks like might be right. I don't want a full manuscript. So you start with a proposal. The first couple of pages is um, basically the what and the why of your book. Don't try too hard here to be earth-shattering or unique or original. Um, don't make huge claims about your book. You might feel that you need to convince a publisher you're Malcolm Gladwell to get any attention. That's not true. Um, don't try to think, oh, I'm the first ever person in the history of publishing to do something like this. How exciting. It's tempting to think that. Um, and you'd be amazed at how many book proposals I get that really are trying hard. And I think that's coming out of anxiety and, and, and uncertainty rather than sort of a huge ego. Um, but be careful about what your claims are. Because editors, we like the familiar. We like doing things again. That really helps us know and guess what's going to happen again. Um, so yeah, don't over egg the issue of originality. <clears throat> On the other hand, a book does have to have an edge. It does have to do something that is fresh somehow, or is a new approach, or a new angle. Um, why would someone want to buy your book and not some of the other ones that are out there? Um, in, a, in, this, in many fields, it's tempting to try and do everything differently. Um, but think again of this issue of buyership. What is it that is going to make someone pick up your book, look at the table of contents, and think, yeah, brilliant, I've been waiting for this. This is my area, it's established, but this is quite exciting. So you need to be able to give the publisher and the proposal a sense of what that is. Um, the next section that comes up is the table of contents. Now this is the spine of the book. And frankly, this is the part of the proposal or any book that I always look at first. Skip the rationale, I'll go straight to this, scan through that, and think, nice, well-structured, comprehensive, there's a good development here. Um, and most peer reviewers, editorial boards, this is where they will start, even though it comes a bit later into the proposal. So this is quite important, um, and you really can't give too much detail in here. What I um, tend to ask for in the table of contents are your chapter titles, and good chapter titles don't have puns, they don't have double entendres or jokes. They are clear and transparent, and I can scan, and I've got the map of the book, and I can navigate. It's got keywords. Another thing that's quite important is that when you have a book, this part of it becomes really important metadata. 
So this is your search engine optimization. So it is all about keywords and repeating keywords and having something that's quite transparent. And you think, oh, but it's so boring. Okay, you can put the interesting bit in your writing in the book. It's very important to have this be clear. Paragraph or two on what you're going to have in the book. And if you've got a set of headings, so your main headings in that chapter, five, seven, eight of them, and you've got that in mind, brilliant. That's really helpful. It's also a really good exercise for you to already at this stage be thinking of the structure of your book at that kind of sub-level. Um, so that I always advise people to try and do that if they can be that granular in their, in their book proposal. So very important part. Another very important part of, of this is the market. And any book proposal guidelines will always have this section. And remember, for you, it's readership. For me, it's buyership. And you've got to be able to explain how those two are going to come together. Detail is never wasted on this section. And again, you don't need to overemphasize. A lot of proposals I get say, oh, this is going to be relevant for sociology and anthropology and gender studies, and it's going to go into business and management and economics, and cross-cultural communication, media studies. And I think, no, it's not. <laughs> and that's fine. It doesn't have to. Primary market. Think of your book as a book. Um, somebody has to find it, literally, on a bookshelf in a store in the library. The bookseller or the librarian has to decide which bookshelf to put it on. Which bookshelf is that going to be? That's your primary market. And then you can say secondary markets in gender studies, anthropology, cross-cultural communication, policy. Great. But be able to show that you realistically understand what the primary market is. Say what it is, and that's fine. Um, Another thing I hear a lot is, but the publisher, you're the market expert. I'm the scholar. I do the content. Why should I have to think about the market? That is so not true. This is an industry where the people who are the producers of the commodity are also the consumers of it. And you are already. You read books. You choose them out of the library. You buy them. You search for journal articles, you use those. You're, you're teaching already, most of you. You are market experts. And, and a publisher, any publisher, is going to be just as interested in your insight and expertise on that market as we are. And even though I already have a pretty good idea about the market as well, I'm curious as to what you can tell me, because there might be something new. You are more related to changes in teaching, perhaps, than, than I am. You're a bit more cutting edge. But also, I want to be reassured that you are thinking about this, that you are going to be writing your book with an audience in mind. And if you can demonstrate to me that you're aware of your market, you're not squeamish or ideological about that word, then already that's a step further towards me thinking, great, this could be a good author. I'm going to say it again, because it's that important. A publisher is just as interested in your interpretation of the market and the competition as they are in the proposed contents of the book. You start with the contents. Don't forget the rest of the proposal, or discount it, or skip it. So the next section um, is the competition. Again, this will come up on every, um, every book proposal. And you might think, you know, competition, like, I'm not competing. I'm doing something new. Even if there isn't any book that you can honestly think of that is really like yours, even if genuinely you're looking and you can't find anything, just come up with something. And again, go back to the bookshelf. The librarian has put your book on the bookshelf, but there are some books that are next to it. What are those books? Understand that. That's your competition. That's fine. Um, be able to assess your book against those books. What do you, you know, what's common among them? That's just as helpful. Um, that will give a publisher con What's new? What don't you like about that book? Um, you know, you're taking a new critical theory approach. That's pretty exciting. Say that. How your book is going to compare. 
And again, another common mistake is to think that publishers don't want more of the same thing. So you look and you think, oh, you know, I work in, pop in popular music. There's already a lot of stuff out there. Publisher is not going to want another one. Not necessarily true. You know, sure, I'm not going to publish six books on popular music in 2015. I might want to stagger them out. But if I have a book on popular music and I've seen it that is done well, maybe sales are growing. Maybe I can see, wow, this really does well in the American market. I definitely want another one and another one. And I'll look for one that is a bit more pedagogical, or I'll look for one that's a bit more critical theory, or I'll look for one that's got an industry organizational studies angle. So if you see something that actually has got a lot of books out there already, and you can do something fresh with that, take confidence from that. And don't let that stop you or make you feel uncertain about, oh, well, that's already a crowded market. I can't go in. Definitely not the case. Again, be aware of the competition. All those other books out there are probably a good thing. Understand how they're working and what your edge is. Yeah, 75% of book proposals that I get have got this line. Oh, there's no competition. Like Under competition, list three, my book is unique. There is no competition. Don't do that. Don't. So you've got your book proposal. What do you do with it? Um, find a publisher. Find out what their name is. If I get um, someone delivers me a book proposal that says, Dear Sir, please find attached my book proposal. I, I won't read the book proposal. Um, don't call me Sir. Find out my name. Dear Mila. Oh, hello. Uh, again, concisely, um, I at this stage, I don't have time to do a lot of reading. You should be able to tell me your idea and your content and your understanding of the market. Six or seven pages quite often covers it. Don't skip the market section or the competition section. Before you do your proposal, also, um, well, you can actually just do a standard proposal, but check out the publisher's proposal guidelines. Oxford University Press will want something slightly different than what I want. It's pretty similar, but every publisher will have their guidelines under you know, author support on their website. Have a look at them first. Add in additional information, restructure, if it's a little bit different, you don't have to cut and paste so much, but make sure that you're giving them all the information that they want. Definitely making sure that you're giving a clear idea of the book structure. Again, this is back to the table of contents. That's what I look at first. And also, um, this is something that's kind of new. The last time I gave this presentation, we didn't really talk about this, but I think it's really good to mention other stuff that you do. If you are a blogger, and you've got tons of followers, it's really worth telling somebody that. Um, if you tweet, podcast, podcast, any other kind of thing, it doesn't mean that you have to, and it definitely doesn't mean that I won't look at your book proposal if you're not on social media. Don't worry about that. But if you do, mention it. Also, if you teach, if you're teaching in this area, definitely mention that as well. It's really helpful for me to get a sense of any future author in the round not just as an expert scholar, but in terms of all of the other activities that they're involved in. Okay, don't write 30 pages on your proposal. If I want to see more, like a sample chapter, I'll ask you and then you can send it to me. No puns, and I know this is really challenging for the humanities, but I hate it. It's not good in the, it's not good on the internet. The digital age has changed the cleverness of post-structural theory. That's gone. Um, and again, don't assume that longer is smarter. And at this stage of a writing career, it's such a common mistake. Think short, think succinct, think lucid. And don't send the entire manuscript. I won't even write back and say, could you please send me a proposal? I'll just say, we don't do that. Same thing goes for the university presses. We want proposals. And then here's what comes next. I'm going to whiz through this really quickly because um, we've just got a few minutes left. I know we started a bit late. You send me a proposal, I might reject it. Don't be disheartened. It probably means 
that it's just not the right subject area for me at SAGE. We don't do literature, we don't do history. I'll say no. Or it means at SAGE we don't do monographs. I'll say no. Don't be disheartened by that. You should get a response fairly quickly at this stage. However, I see a proposal and think, hmm, okay, good match. I've been looking for something in this area. I really want something on, on feminism and popular culture. Brilliant. Um, what I might do is ask you to change the proposal a little bit, add some things in. But the next step is I want to get market feedback. So I will send the proposal out to people teaching and researching in that subject area. And I'll get them to answer a questionnaire. I'll be asking them about the intellectual merits, the writing style, the market potential. Would they use it in their teaching? What do you think of the table of contents? Any gaps? Um, and then the proposals come back in. I read them and I share them with you. And so we can decide together whether there's anything else that we might need to do to strengthen this proposal. Now, you might get rejected at this point. It might, the reviews might come back saying, no, not relevant for this market, incredibly old-fashioned, or whatever. It doesn't usually happen, but it might happen. Um, but, again, that's very rare. Editors are very good at assessing a market, and sending a proposal out for review is an investment that we're making. We don't do it just for anything. Um, we will do it for what we think will work, and it usually does. So, with reviews, we then strengthen things a little bit. The next step is, I take it to the editorial meeting. So this is a big meeting with senior representatives from sales, marketing, um, the editorial director, other editors. We sit around and discuss the proposal. And at that stage, that is where your editor is your champion. They really are, if they take it to the editorial meeting, it's because they want to publish it. Um, you might get rejected at this point, at this stage. And that is only because other aspects of the company will think your market is too small. And again, it's only too small for that publishing company. Remember, everybody's got a different business model. So you might get rejected at this stage. Probably not. But if you do, don't be disheartened. Try again. Another publisher will just measure things differently and will take a different approach. Plus, you've already been through the peer review process. Um, so your proposal is already strengthened. So you're, you're on your way. What I talk about the P&L, so finance, that's really, really where it starts. Are we going to lose money or not? Um, we talk about the reviews, market research. Um, I talk about how well you have engaged with the peer review process. If you're open and have good ideas and are responsive, that's definitely a plus. If you say, oh, these reviews are stupid, it's all personal, um, I think, no, no, maybe not so good. Or I might agree with you, you know, but I probably wouldn't send you those reviews. And then a decision is made to offer you a contract. Um, we might have some revisions that we, we want to make, um, but otherwise you get a contract at that point. Um, and then away you go and write the book. So that is about how we choose authors. Um, but it's also about how you choose a publisher. So some advice there. I mean, you will already, just from the books that you've bought, borrowed, researched, read, cited, you'll have a pretty good sense of who's who out there already, and that really is the place to start. Publisher's reputation. Um, their market experience and data is really important. Are they out there in the market? Um, if they already have a lot of books in your subject area, it means, yes, they've got market information and data. That's a really good place to start. Colleague recommendations. Your, um, your senior colleagues will love to tell you all about their experiences with their publishers. The good, the bad, the ugly, um, how efficient everybody was, how supportive they were or weren't, the terrible marketing, the great marketing. Um, I have really found in my experience that academics do love to dish on their relationships with publishers. So you will get a full and rich set of feedback from your senior colleagues. Um, also, like just, just books that you like. I mean, books are still in print, and they're probably going to stay in print for a while. Like the way a good book feels, I think, is important to me. Um, it's also a marker of how much is the publisher investing in their publishing program. Size, location, um, you know, lesser issues, but it still is this very regional publisher. That might be appropriate for some kinds of books. Do they have a, a global marketing program? That might be better for certain kinds of books. 
Um, a good way to find that out is conferences. You'll see them at conferences. That'll give you a, a, a very good idea of who's committed to that subject area. Legitimacy, again, watch out for those vanity publishers. Um, you probably have to go a couple of clicks into their website to figure out. If they ask you to pay for the copy editing, be very wary. Um, ask your senior colleagues of their experience whether they're familiar with any of this. If someone emails you saying, I've noticed you've just published your PhD, we'd love to publish it, it costs 5,000 pounds. That's vanity publishing. And there's a lot more of that out there um, than there used to be. Be careful. They're all sometimes also called predatory publishers because um, they do kind of like slink around like hyenas. So be careful. <laughs> and it's not good. It's <clears throat> not good for your career. Anyone will tell you that. I'm going to skip that slide. So getting to know your publisher, again, this is really a wrap up. I've said all of it before. Think about your market. Don't, you know, really be aware of that. And remember, market for us is about buyers. For you, it's about readers. They're the same people, um, but they're both important. Think about what they want. Don't go in cold. Do a little research. Find out your publishing company. Don't just spam publishers in academia. Um, that's not necessary. So find out what they want, what they publish, what they do, what their name is, um, what they published before, what you know, have a look at the catalog. Don't tell publishers it's one of a kind, even, even if it's true. Don't. And remember, it's no longer your PhD, it's your book. I am working on my book. Think of what else you can offer. Your teaching experience, so important, even for scholarly publishers. Your blogging, your presence, your followers, your, your activity, your engagement, your excitement, all of that, really important. And think also about your career strategy beyond the book. And I don't have time to go into that, but it might be that a book with a publisher isn't exactly what you need. And it really depends where you think you're going. And it might be that building a more public profile, doing some more applied um, you know, sort of casework with your research is a better aspect, and you're going to be surrounded by colleagues who can give you advice on that. Um, really think about a book. Yes, here's some ways to really try to get that get that started, but it's not the thing for everybody. <coughs> um, this next bit takes one minute, and it's just. Where do you go from there? Like, how do you start getting to know publishers? Um, here's how I find authors, recommendations, for sure. I'm always out there networking, listening, having people introduce other people to me. I have met um, PhD students who have then finished their PhD, got a job, and been looking to write their first book. And I've kept talking with those people, get a sense of like, wow, that person is great, interesting, engaged. Um, I've also found really, really careful, thoughtful, engaging peer reviews that have come back from other proposals that I've got. And I think, wow, this person is the person who should be writing the book. <laughs> Definitely. And I'm like, you should do this. Um, journal citations. So I do a lot of, also because I work in journals, I do quite a bit of bibliometric analysis. I mean, don't worry about that so far. But it's, it's like I'm out there looking for hot topics, not necessarily just big names, although that does help. But hot topics, agenda setting, where there is kind of a reaction out there in the scholarly community, publishers are paying attention to that. Social media profile, again, I'm not even on Facebook, so I can't tell anybody else to be. Um, but that's something, if, if a person is blogging, that's great. Um, and I was just telling Ajira a story about a new author I've just secured who's going to be amazing, who has started tweeting to me pages of his book proposal, which I thought was kind of brilliant, and I'm really into it, and so I've started tweeting them. Um, but he's, he, it's a book on social media, by the way, so it is connected. Um, but increasingly, this is something that we do look at, and part of that is, are you going to be very well placed to market your own book through your networks? Brilliant. Um, and a surprise proposal, definitely not out of unheard of. Most books are, start out from a conversation that I have with someone, but it definitely happens that someone just writes to me, Dear Mila, 
I'd really love for you to take a look at this book proposal. I'm really impressed with Sage's books. I've been using them and reading them for years. You've just published this great thing, Critical Introduction to Social Media. I think you'd be perfect to take a look at this. I would be so grateful if you could read my book proposal. Look at the book proposal. Wow, hot topic. Great. It definitely still does work that way. So, what can you do? You have to keep submitting to journals. Everyone is going to tell you you have to do that. Special issue ideas, that's important. Again, this is just part of you being out there, building your CV, being part of a network. Do send in book proposals. There's no reason why you shouldn't. There's absolutely nothing to stop you from putting together a good book proposal and sending it in, even if you haven't published a book before. If someone asks you to do a review of someone else's book proposal, say yes. It is such a good learning experience and someone might even commission you to write that book. Pay attention to those. Peer review is what makes it all go round. From now on, peer review is one of the most important parts of this big machine. Take care with reviews. And in general, you're going to be asked to do a lot of reviewing. Um, do it thoughtfully. It's really important. People read it and pay attention to it. It changes people's directions. But it also impacts the kinds of things that I look for as a publisher as well. If you're at a conference, come say hi, introduce yourself, don't be shy. Um, you don't have to approach somebody with a book idea. Actually, I hate, I don't, I don't, I don't even like that. Just come up and say, hi, well, I love your books. Um, and I'll remember. Um, if an editor is coming to the campus and you're teaching a course and they've seen that and they say, oh, I'd love to come and talk to you about your research and teaching, say yes. Social media profile, again, you don't have to, I don't, but it does help again, is being able to set you up as a marketer of your own book and understand a little bit about publishing, which hopefully now you all do. That's it. Over.